Hello, uh, my name is Viktor Olimpitsky. I work at Samsung AI Center in Moscow and at Skolko Institute of Science and Technology. Uh, today, I will present recent advances with neural avatars that we have made with this wonderful team at Samsung. Yasser has made an excellent introduction to the topic of neural avatars before me. Um, avatars that use neural networks for rendering are getting very realistic and the avatars from his team are sort of uh, the gold standard in terms of realism and mimics accuracy. Uh, the remaining problem is that most neural avatar systems require a lot of video data of a particular person to create an avatar of that person. Or at least so it was a year and a half ago. So for the last year and a half, we've been working hard to address that. Last year, we have presented a few short system that uh, was able to create head avatars from few photographs or even from a single photograph. And there, the avatar was driven by facial key points, preferably the key points extracted from uh, the same person. And this uh, whole thing may be useful in various telepresence scenarios. Uh, under the hood, we had an architecture like this where uh, an embedded network was trained in parallel with the generator network. The embedded network would uh, look at one or multiple uh, or several photographs uh, of a person. Uh, it will map each uh, person, each photograph to an embedding space. If we have multiple photographs, we will average those vectors. And uh, then the resulting vector uh, was used to condition the generating process. The generator maps the rasterized landmarks to the image of uh, the avatar and um, the embedding vector is used to rescale and to bias uh, the activations inside the generator uh, during the generation process and in this way to inject the person specific information. Now it all worked uh, uh, but there were issues. First to overcome the identity gap uh, uh, it was needed to fine tune the generator to the training photographs. And that still required um, up to minutes on a desktop GPU. Furthermore, to run the generator network at sufficient frame rate, even at 224 by 224 resolution required a dedicated high-end GPU. We've got a lot of uh, popular press attention with animations like this but they also show the pitfalls. First, we see that the personalization was not ideal. For example, we, uh, we lost the famous Marilyn Monroe's mole. And thinking about the method, you could sort of understand why it was lost. It would be hard for the method for the embedder to allocate parts of the embedding space for all possible moles in all possible parts of the face. And even if it could do it, uh, it would be very hard to learn such mapping uh, without seeing lots of people with similar moles. And Marin Monroe's mole is sort of unique. Um, yeah, and um, also as we, said, as we said in the paper, to get such animations, uh, we had to carefully pick the driver key point tracks from people with similar face geometry to those celebrities. Otherwise, those animations would look bad. Um, so today I want to present several updates on few shot avatars. In part one of my talk, I will focus on head avatars and will present the model uh, that makes both inference and avatar creation process faster and feasible for mobile devices. Furthermore, uh, the model can achieve better personalization um, and I will also discuss how to make cross person reenactment possible. In part two, which will be smaller, I will focus on full body avatars and uh, our very recent results there. I will discuss a new neural model for full body avatars and I will discuss how future learning can be made possible for that new rendering model. So let me start uh, with the new head avatar model, which increases speed and personalization. Our new model comprises multiple steps uh, and it has more components than the previous one. As before, we input to the source image and its key points into the embedder network and it produces a set of embeddings which encode the image. 
And in this case, uh, they are a bunch of tensors. So they are higher dimensional than before. We use these embeddings to predict the adaptive parameters of uh, two generators, the texture generator, which is the new thing, and um, the main generator, which we use at inference time. So the texture generator predicts a high frequency texture, uh, uh, which contains personalized details. Uh, notably, this texture uh, also has errors which may not be visible in the source image. And uh, the texture gener generator still predicts them. And this allows us to generate uh, um, per the person from new viewpoints. Um, so the inference generator is also conditioned on the embeddings via the same RDN connections. It takes as an input, not the rasterization, but the, just the vector of uh, face uh, key points. Um, so we don't have this encoding part to save uh, uh, the operations. Um, and uh, um, the generator outputs uh, uh, the low frequency blurry uh, uh, image of a person. And on top of that, it generates the warping field, which prescribes how to warp the high frequency texture predicted by the texture uh, generator, okay? And the resulting image is composed of, uh, as a, is obtained as a sum of the two parts, uh, the uh, low frequency image and the warped texture image. Optionally, we can also ask the generator and the texture generator to predict uh, the segmentation uh, of a person to get rid of uh, the background and uh, also not to spend uh, uh, the modeling power on the background. So uh, if we look how it looks like with the segmentation, this is how it works. So given the segmented input image, we first predict the high frequency texture using um, uh, the texture generator. And then at test time, given the driver, we extract the key points and then we predict uh, the low frequency image and uh, uh, the high frequency image uh, is obtained by warping the texture. And this is the output. You see that we get a reasonably realistic result. Um, it, the mimics is subdued, but I will get to the point of getting better mimics uh, later. Uh, so importantly, uh, so the main thing is that at test time, we only need to run uh, the, main, uh, the main generator network, this one. And if you will look at it carefully, it uh, only predicts uh, uh, low frequency things. It predicts the low frequency smooth image and it predicts a smooth or a piecewise smooth warping field that we apply to the texture. The texture is high frequency, but the warping field is uh, quite smooth. Um, and the also optionally predicts the segmentation, but all these things uh, don't uh, have like uh, details. So we can make this generator network really small and really fast. And this way we can sort of go down to 40 milliseconds on Andreno 640 uh, mobile GPU, which you can find, for example, in Galaxy S10, which is a uh, penultimate uh, generation of uh, flagship smartphones. Um, in the original system, we used the fine tuning of the generator by backpropagation for better personalization. It was slow and uh, really hard to port to mobile. Uh, so in the new system, we decided that we will learn a feed forward network uh, that looks at the training image. Uh, it looks at its um, reproduction by the network uh, initialized in the pre uh, using texture generator and the embedder. And it looks at those two, it compares them and it backprops uh, a simple loss, uh, something like pixel wise uh, loss into the texture. Uh, and then we learn an updating network which looks uh, at uh, the original high frequency texture and uh, the um, gradient of uh, a simple loss with respect to this texture. And it predicts the update or a series of updates uh, to the texture to improve the personalization. And when we train this feed forward network, we uh, make it to predict uh, such updates that uh, the out of sample uh, views get better. And when we measure this quality, we use the full loss, which includes perceptual terms and adversarial terms. So at meta training sort of stage, we use uh, complex losses uh, 
to uh, update and to train this uh, updater network, uh, we call it texture enhancement network. And uh, at, then at test time, or uh, more precisely, at the time of creating uh, uh, the avatar, we only look at the gradient of a simple loss, which is easy to backprop, and which we can, uh, and this this backprop we can easily implement on mobile device. So the whole updater network is essentially a feed forward network, which is uh, run for multiple few iterations and can be ported to the mobile phone. Um, and when we, when we train it, when we roll it for few iterations and we train it with more complex losses using back propagation. Okay, uh, and this is uh, co uh, based with some modification, the learned gradient descent idea and inspired by the deep view system. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, here you see an example with and without texture enhancement. Uh, and while the updates are subtle, uh, they, are, they are important for personalization and for the realism. We get these wrinkles, uh, we um, get uh, the garments better and overall the person looks more like uh, uh, himself with this uh, texture enhancement. Uh, here, uh, let me compare or show you some comparison results of our method with a very strong competitor, the first of the motion model that appeared at last uh, uh, new ribs. Um, so we retrained our, uh, uh, we, we retrained their architecture on our training set, also after pruning their uh, network to have similar complexity to ours. So it's a very strong competitor, but you can see that in terms of sharpness of hair and in terms of general sharpness, our method is uh, ahead, and this is uh, confirmed by the user study. So this is uh, one more comparison. So in each case, uh, so all models were run in a single shot mode. Uh, so we have single source photograph, and uh, then sort of tries to reproduce this uh, video by, uh, in our case, we'll only show the key points. Okay, so this is one more example. Okay, so the model I have just described uh, used facial key points to drive the animation. Um, and uh, using key points uh, um, come with uh, its own problems. Key points are person specific, so you cannot really drive another person like a, a celebrity with uh, uh, someone else's key points. Uh, and um, uh, also um, there is a a limited degree to which key points represent the actual mimics. So to address this limitation, um, we learn new pose representation um, and we learn it uh, together with uh, um, uh, the whole avatar system. So we train a uh, whole thing on a big data set of videos and we use a uh, uh, solely reconstruction losses and we try to get pose uh, um, and get try to, to get good pose encoders based only on the construction losses. So in more detail in more detail we train in parallel two encoders, the pose encoder and the identity encoder to which we show frames of the same video and, uh, and we do it for multiple videos but in each episode we show just frames from the same video. Um, and both encoders produce pictorial descriptors, uh, so the pose encoder takes some frame uh, with some head augmentations and produces a vector which should describe its pose. And the identity encoder takes different frames from the same video, um, extract vectors from each of them, and then average them to produce the identity embedding. Okay, and then the generator network uh, takes both of these embeddings and use the other mechanism to condition on these embeddings and um, it tries to generate uh, the uh, frame plugged into the pose encoder without augmentations and also its uh, uh, segmentation mask. And the loss is obtained by comparing uh, uh, the result uh, of the construction with the ground truth uh, frame that was input to the pose encoder and also the segmentations, the uh, obtained one and the real ones. So we use a different perception under serial losses and we train the whole system together, both the uh, all parts, the identity encoder, the pose encoder and the generator network. 
Um, we have found that our system learns both descriptors that are almost person agnostic. So there is not no person specific information extracted by the post encoder or almost no information. And all the person specific information comes from the identity encoder. And this is achieved solely by uh, using mimics preserving augmentations here and also by uh, limiting the capacity of uh, the pose encoder network. So we use a smaller network for pose encoder and larger high capacity network for identity or encoder. Okay. And in this way, the system tries to sort of pull all the person specific information through the identity branch. Here you see uh, uh, the reenactment, cross person reenactment results. Um, so here you see like uh, Igor Burkov, the first author of the, of the paper driving a bunch of uh, celebrities and another celebrity driving the celebrities. And you see that uh, the mimics is uh, reasonably well preserved and also the identity of each animated person um, is also preserved. So there is like a very small leakage of identity from uh, the driving person to the um, uh, to the celebrity, which is a really hard to achieve. Um, so putting this all together, um, here is an example of uh, the bilayer avatar that runs on the new uh, pose descriptors. Uh, here it is in the self reenactment mode. Okay, so uh, this is a, a person driving the avatar created based on a photograph of her taken on a different day. Okay, so this is uh, the low frequency component predicted. Uh, and this is the warp texture component predicted. So this is the warping field predicted by the generator. Um, and when we combine, combine the two, we get uh, this result, which uh, is sort of it's fast enough to run on mobile. Uh, here is like a uh, cross person uh, experiment where uh, the uh, same sequences in the previous frame is used to, to drive celebrity photographs and painting. And um, what you can see is that we really managed, I hope you can see it, that we managed to get uh, Marilyn Monroe's mole in this case. Uh, so by the way, this mall appears after texture enhancement network is applied. Before that, this mall is uh, not there. Okay, so uh, that was about the head avatar part. Uh, now let me briefly present some results that we have got recently for full body avatars. This is still very much work in progress, but I believe they, uh, they are interesting. Uh, full body avatars is in many ways a harder problem, especially if you want to be able to render the body from all possible viewpoints. You really need a good geometric proxy for this. And in this project, we pick the excellent deformable mesh model called Simple X from Michael Black's group and Max Planck. The problem with this geometric model, as well as with most other uh, models of this kind, is that uh, they only model human geometry without clothing and without hair. So to add clothing and hair, we use the deferred neural rendering idea from the Matthias Nessner's group in Munich. In the original work, uh, uh, they also show that uh, how it works for faces. So here we start with by checking that it can be expanded to the full bodies. Um, so this is how it works. Uh, uh, the colors as well as the local clothing and hair geometry are modeled by uh, the so-called neural texture. The neural texture is a multi-dimensional image. Uh, we use 16, uh, 16 channels in our experiments. And here I visualize uh, the first three channels as uh, RGB. The texture is then wrapped around the simple X mesh using a Z-buffer rasterizer such as OpenGL. And then the resulting image is processed by the rendering network to create a realistic view of a person. A note uh, that the loose cloth clothing and uh, hair is decoded by the rendering network and added uh, to the image. And then for the new pose, 
the network can reproduce uh, the new image. We can fit this model that is uh, the texture and the rendering network parameters to a large set of video frames of a given person or several given people in parallel because they then have different textures. Uh, so we can do that simply by generating images, comparing them to ground truth uh, images, and then back propagating uh, the loss and updating the parameters of the rendering network and uh, the textures. Okay, this is how it works. Um, here are two examples of that. Uh, both of these avatars were creating uh, from long videos of these two people who are engineers at our center. Um, and they share the same rendering network, by, uh, by the way, so that we can put them, render them together within the same scene. Here we show them in two different, well, disjointly uh, in different scenes um, in the context of augmented reality application. Um, and uh, they are animated by the motion of a third different person, which you don't see. Um, so these results are interesting, they're uh, they quite good, but um, uh, they used uh, video data to create those avatars. Those videos actually don't need to be very long, uh, mm -hmm. short videos would, would do, but what if we want to create avatars from a single image or a few images? For that, what we do is we train a generative model of neural textures. And we do that by essentially taking the style gun model, its second version, and embedding uh, this style gun generator into our rendering model. So the style gun generates the neural textures, and uh, those textures are wrapped uh, around SMPL X bodies, um, um, which are bodies fitted to real images in the data set. And then, oh, sorry. Uh, and then uh, um, we, for each sample texture, we create renderings uh, for two different body pose and camera positions. And we take those renderings, put them into our discriminator, which unlike style gun looks at two different images of the same person. And it tries to um, check if they really look as uh, two images of the same person. So it uh, checks both the realism and whether the identity is preserved between uh, these two images. Okay. We train our model on a large data set of TEDx talks, uh, about like 40,000 uh, talks. Unfortunately, it's, uh, while it's very diverse in terms of demographics and clothing, it also has limitations in, term in terms of resolution and viewpoint coverage as well as some very peculiar lighting distribution. It also very rarely shows people from the back. Uh, anyway, this is the best that we have uh, right now. And this is uh, uh, how samples from the model look like after, after training. These are non cherry picked random samples. Uh, and this is uh, sort of, uh, they, uh, the same or like other non cherry picked samples. Uh, wrapped over some pilot bodies performing uh, some animations. Showed it to my wife yesterday. Uh, she said it looked like zombie apocalypse. Uh, I, I think these are actually quite nice people. Uh, I don't know what you think, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, zombie or not, the point of the generative model is not to generate samples, but to provide us a prior uh, onto neural textures uh, when we create avatars in the few shot mode. So given a single or a handful of images, we can optimize the texture, not directly, but by tweaking to the style gun parameters, uh, uh, both uh, the style vector, uh, different style vectors, in different resolutions and the parameters of the generator. So we optimize those two parameters and uh, um, we try uh, to fit uh, the ground truth image. And we initialize the process by running uh, the pre-trained encoder, which maps uh, the image to the corresponding style vector and which we train on synthetic data. Okay. Um, it does not quite work in a single shot mode. Uh, you can see that uh, the segmentation is 
failing. Most likely reason is the fact that we rarely see people from the back in TED Talks. So a good prior um, how a person can le look from the back, given its front image, given her his front image, is not learned. Uh, a better data set should make it possible. But in the eight shot mode, when we're given uh, eight training uh, images, uh, the results are better. So we can create uh, reasonably looking avatars um, from all uh, sides. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, this uh, is close. Or this is the state of the art for that kind of scenario. OK, so to conclude, um, Neural avatars are a promising topic, and few short generation of avatars uh, seem to be possible. Of course, there is a gap remaining with um, the best results obtained from videos from a um, uh, uh, large amount of data in non few shot mode, and this seems to be a promising research direction. Uh, the quality of results in few shot mode and in multi shot model. Uh, mode of course depends uh, strongly on the training data set and collecting mining creating good data sets for this task seems to be a big part of the equation okay so i will uh leave you with uh, the references of the works my talk is based on uh, the last two are not published yet but we will put them on archive soon and this is the fantastic team that made it all happen um so thank you very much for that.